terrible, terrible, terrible. Oh, where's the camera? Don't know what this is doing. I have hair growing on my shoulder. Hey guys, I'm back. I'm Jalen. I'm a part-time family physician. I'm full-time mom to three. My husband and I live in the Pacific Northwest. Today, we're talking about snot. Ready? No! Blow. 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 Six season is upon us. And in my household, six season lasts from the start of school at the beginning of September to springtime, which here in the Pacific Northwest is usually like end of April time period. We deal with a lot of bodily fluids during this time period. So, I mean, I figured why not make a video about it? Everybody, everybody, everybody's nuts. I'm gonna talk you through some basic guidelines for newborns, kids, and adults. And I wanted to provide you with a little bit of reassurance with a couple of statistics. First of all, the littlest of the bunch babies. <laughs> Newborns in particular and kiddos under the age of six months. So if you have a baby that's under the age of 30 days, I hope that your healthcare provider has talked to you about this. The very most important thing you need to know is that number one, you should always take your baby's temperature. There are lots of ways to do this. I brought some props here. So um, you can do an oral temperature, which generally is not as dependable in that age group. You can do an axillary temperature in the armpit, decent. But if you truly are worried about your baby's temperature, you should be prepared to take a rectal temperature. Now, obviously, please don't use the same thermometer for an oral temperature and a rectal temperature. We bought this thermometer, um, it's by Safety First. I'm not super impressed with it, but this is an example. And it came with different um, detachable heads. So you just take, hold on. <laughs> well, you're supposed, oh look, I got it, got it, I got it. Okay, so it came, came with detachable heads. So like this is the axillary head. And then as a special treat, this is the rectal probe. So obviously, if you don't have one of these, if you just have like a basic run of the mill thermometer, these are super cheap. I was avoided buying these because I thought they were so expensive, but these honestly are like less than $7. I think I bought 10 of them the last time I was at the store and they were on sale just so I could put them in every medicine bag and have them in almost every cupboard in the house. So this is just a cheapo Western family version um, thermometer. I highly recommend that if you're taking rectal temperatures on your kiddos, you label them because that's really gross. You should be prepared. Your provider can go over how to take a rectal temperature on your baby. But the point being that if you have a newborn baby under the age of 30 days and you find that they have a rectal temperature of greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, please take them in for an evaluation. They need to be evaluated for sepsis or meningitis and this is very important, okay? The end. If you have a baby that's under 90 days old and they have a fever of greater than 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit, please take them in for evaluation. Typically, it's not quite as urgent or emergent, but the risk of pneumonia and meningitis in this age group is quite high, which is why all of us in healthcare kind of freak out about it. Babies under the age of six months often get sick. Kiddos who are in daycare with higher exposures, who attend playgroups, who attend church nursery, these kiddos are getting sick a lot more than kids who are just kept at home. Part of this is because I like to say that their immune system is just having a little buffet of the over 200 cold viruses that exist. Okay, the first thing I want you to remember is to trust your gut. If you feel like your kiddo has something that's up more than just a cold, other than just a snotty nose, please take them into your provider. I never ever scorn, what's the right word? I don't know. I never look down on parents who are just concerned wanting their kiddo to be checked out. I wanna make sure their lungs are clear, I wanna make sure they don't have a documented fever, and I wanna make sure that their ears are fine. Ear infections are super common in kids. I try not to treat them very often with antibiotics, but sometimes if the kiddo has a fever, is under the age of two, and um, appears to be quite ill, we will give antibiotics for them. The American Academy of Pediatrics has some pretty clear guidelines on this. Is remember that when your kiddo is congested, they may have trouble eating. So. A couple things that I often hear parents worry about is their solid food intake. Guess what? Our bodies are designed to survive on liquid only or very little solid food for at least 24 or 48 hours. I generally, in our household, I give my kids what they want when they're sick. That doesn't mean they get to eat ice cream all day, but they typically will stick to things like oatmeal, applesauce, some mashed potatoes. If your kid doesn't want to eat a hamburger because they've got snot rockets, guys, it's fine. 
they're gonna be okay. The most important thing is to keep your kiddo hydrated. Make sure you're counting wet diapers if you've got a kid that's diapered, especially those that are not on solid foods yet, and make sure that you're extra patient with feedings. If you have a breastfed infant, it might be beneficial for you to get in the shower with them, a warm steamy shower or sit in a warm steamy bathroom. Steam's a natural cleanser of the nose. Cleanser meaning like it just clears out the snot. I don't mean that it like detoxes the nose in any way. Please don't believe that stuff. But it does clear out the snot quite easily. And one of my favorite things to do with my kiddos when they were breastfeeding was to sit in a steamy shower and let the natural nasal breathing while they were breastfeeding take care of a lot of the snot. It works amazingly and no medicine is needed. If you feel like a cold is lasting an extra long time, please remember that cold viruses can stack. This is very unfortunate for parents and kids alike, but it does happen. For instance, your kid gets sick on a Tuesday, they seem to be getting better on, uh, let's say the following Monday, and by the next Wednesday, they're sick again. There is a possibility that it's the same virus that got worse, but more likely because we typically have healthy immune systems, it's a new cold virus that they are exposed to in the meantime. This is possible, you guys, and this is why kids can be sick for literally 30 days in a row. There are ways to test which variant of rhinovirus you are infected with, but it's very expensive and honestly completely unnecessary. Most rhinovirus or common cold viruses are completely self-resolving most of the time, um, and in kids in particular, they can last longer than you think they should, which really sucks. Kids ages six months to six years will get an average of six to 10 colds per sick season, which is generally October to April, each cold lasting an average of six to 10 days. You guys, if you calculate that six to 10 colds, let's say your kid is an eight, lasting eight days, that's 64 days, two full months that your kid will be sick. I counted a couple of years ago, we had a newborn, a three-year-old and a five-year-old at the time. One of my kids had eight colds and the other one had nine colds in one sick season. That is ridiculous. That's also a lot of snot. I will say I am not a germaphobe. My kids are going to be sick. They're going to be sick a lot. And we did isolate last winter when the flu was just rampant. We, we did couch church a lot last winter. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with isolation and you need to remember that. But if you can't avoid isolation, we have working parents, we have play groups and birthday parties, it's okay that your kids get sick. It's actually, I don't wanna say it's good for their immune system, but exposure is not a bad thing. And oftentimes exposures as a kid often contribute to healthy adults, healthier adults. Somebody's not gonna like that statement. I came up with a little mnemonic to try to help you remember if we return to the basics, like let's pretend that we live in a cabin in the woods. We have the ability to boil water, we have the ability to make salt water, but that's it. Honestly, there is a chance that our colds would last just as long as they do when we have 9 million medications to choose from over the counter and total confusion about how to treat our kids' colds. So there are four things that I highly recommend to every parent who has a sick kid. Number one is snuggles. Your kiddo, when they are sick, tends to be a lot more needy. Kiddos, especially those who are toddlers who have no idea what are going, what's going on, are going to be a little bit more clingy, and that's okay. That doesn't mean that they're sicker than they should be. It just means that you can offer them a few extra snuggles. The second thing that I highly recommend using regularly is steam. This can come in the form of a humidifier. I don't care if it's cold or hot. This can come in the form of warm showers. Our youngest is sick this morning and she started her morning with a shower. Ask honey, the door. Wipe the door with your sponge. Actually two showers. She also took a bath. Our water bill is going to be huge this month. So if you have a kiddo of any age or if you are sick, steam is something that I highly recommend. One other thing to keep in mind is that um, there have been lots of studies on Vicks Vapor Rub, which essentially is made of eucalyptus. I think we have strong enough evidence as far as scientific literature goes to prove that essential oils are effective, but the case studies and um, personal testimonies from people are kind of incredible at how well essential oils work. I haven't gotten super into them, keep in mind, but I do use eucalyptus and tea tree oil on a very regular basis in a diffuser or in a shower, a warm shower, when ourselves or our kids are sick. Also, oh, I totally forgot about this. 
There's also nasal steamers that you can buy. I don't own one. I bought one for my dad for a gift for Father's Day. They're kind of cool though. It's like, uh, you know the old thing that you put your head over boiling water, except they don't um, involve the risk of burns. So Vix makes one on Amazon for like $26. And then you can buy ones that are like $200 almost. It's the whole concept of thinning your snot and uh, decreasing nasal secretions using natural steam. Something to keep in mind. The fourth tip is suction and saline. So regardless of the age of yourself or your kid, kids in particular, using nasal saline can be quite helpful. Ready? <laughs> One. Go! <laughs> okay, other side. You want to hold it? You hold it. I really like this aerosolized saline from Arm & Hammer. It's my favorite. They make off brands, but the um, tip on it tends to be not as hearty. I have no affiliation with them. I just love this product. They also, you can only find it on Amazon now, they make a um, decongestant version of this and it has like tea tree oil in it. Um, you'll have to talk with your doctor about whether or not it's safe to use, but we love it and it's really hard to find. So it's kind of like a golden commodity around here. The last time I checked, Amazon had it. I'm not sure if they're still making it. Um, I have never been able to find it in a store, but again, we live in a fairly small city here. Could not find our bulb suction, but I am a huge fan of the, nas the Nose Frida for kiddos. The Dr. Brown's version I don't think works as well, but the actual Nose Frida is an awesome thing. If you don't have it, I highly recommend getting it. Um, and it's also a great baby shower gift. Okay, the last S is to stop the fever. Fevers can really make you feel crummy, and there is some evidence that bacteria dies or viruses die at a certain temperature. So lots of people are going to give my kid Tylenol or ibuprofen for their fever. I want whatever they're infected with to die, which is very reasonable. However, if you as an adult have ever had a fever of a greater than 101 degrees Fahrenheit, it is awful. So please remember, um, Tylenol and ibuprofen are typically safe to give. No ibuprofen in kiddos under the age of six months ever, period, the end. Don't ever give it. Their kidneys aren't developed enough to handle it. Ready for your review? Snuggles, steam, saline, stop the fever. Back to basics, you guys. Life can be much more simple. In 2017 and 2018, the FDA conducted a review of a lot of homeopathic brands of medication. One of these was Highlands. I love Highland stuff. I think it's amazing. I felt like it worked really well for our kids. However, most of the um, arguments against this was because it was used in quantities too high or on kids too little. So please pay attention to package labeling. And if there's any doubt, you need to ask your healthcare provider. Using things on your kiddos does not mean that you're using things on tiny adults. All kids' medications are weight-based, and this is important to recognize because if you have a teeny tiny two-year-old and you are dosing them as if they are a six-year-old, this is obviously problematic. I'm a big fan of a lot of the homeopathic stuff over the counter. This is where the crunchy granola part of my practice comes in, but I do want it to be done safely. I'm not gonna comment on sick adults other than, please don't go to your doctor after three days of being sick unless you think you have the flu. I don't even know if I should say that on here. That seems kind of cold. I'm just going to say pleasantly that most viruses and cold viruses that adults have will resolve. Now that this video is 45 minutes long, hopefully you walked away with something. But just remember, hand washing, basic soap and water, you don't need anything fancy, limiting exposures, and overall living a healthy lifestyle with rich whole foods, plant-focused diet, and regular physical activity will probably keep you the healthiest of all. Have a great day. Bye.